Okay, cool. I'm going to begin then. Um, and I first want to introduce myself. My name is Louise. I work for an organization, an NGO called Tactical Tech. I'm an events coordinator on a project there called The Glassroom. Um, Tactical Tech is an international NGO. We're based in Berlin, Germany, and our work engages with both um, citizens and civil society organizations to explore and mitigate the impact of technology on society. Um, a, a more brief way to describe the work we do is um, we often say that we work towards demystifying technology. Um, this is put the data detox kit, which I have a printed version here. The data detox kit gives you simple steps for you to um, control your privacy, security, and well-being. Um, you can find more information on their website and all of the content in many languages. Uh, this, this workshop we'll be doing today is 60 minutes. Um, I'll try to keep it brief and end on time. Uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's a workshop that goes along with our latest edition of The Glassroom, which is the Glassroom Misinformation Edition, which can also be accessed um, online, and I'll share links uh, at the end. Um, so, okay. Cool. So I just wanted to go over a few ground rules. Um, we can skip the first one since uh, I'm alone on stage. Um, but, you know, please feel free to take part. Um, we have a lot of like more interactive parts to this workshop. So at any points um, where we have a game or to spot something, feel free to interact in the chat. Um, and if you have any tech, tech issues, let us know. So today, let me just try to, today we will define misinformation and disinformation and distinguish them. We'll learn some digital investigation techniques. Um, and through this, we'll be able to identify a few different methods that we can take to stop the spread of misleading information. Um, yeah, maybe since we don't have much time, we can maybe keep the roll call on the chat. And I'd love to hear from where, you, where everyone here is calling from. So if you just like to write down your name, where you're calling from, and what weather are you feeling like today, um, yeah, I'd love to go through the go through later and see who is here. Um, yeah, and in the meantime, feel free to write down uh, who you are and where you're calling from. And in the meantime, I'm just going to start um, by introducing and talking about why is information so complicated. Um, first, we need to take a step back and look at everything that surrounds information that we see every day. Oh, and I see some people writing. So hi, Selma. Hi, Louise. Uh, great to hear from you both. Hi, Erica. OK, so uh, one of the things that, um, yeah, one of the bits of information that surrounds us that has changed drastically is the internet. Um, the internet has really changed the way we consume information. Uh, first of all, the sheer amount of information that's available to us um, is something that we should note. Second, the way that we consume information has changed. Um, whereas before we'd go to a library or get a newspaper every morning, we now have the whole world at our fingertips through social media and through the 24-hour news cycle. Um, and finally, the information we see is often based on algorithm or algorithmically generated content which means that we, the way we use the internet, the things we search for, what we post and what we buy is often fed back to us. Um, so, you know, what you might see on your social media or on search engine results may be different from someone else sat right next to you. And this is often what we call a filter bubble or an echo chamber. Um, and it can really have a huge impact on the way that we, um, yeah, the way that we process and receive information. So just a quick quiz, um, can anyone guess uh, how many things are searched on Google every day? Hi, Sue. Hi, Merlin.
any guesses in the are we in um the millions are we in the billions merlin says millions okay so every yeah asama says billions so every day um 3.5 things are searched on google um which should be yeah which maybe is a surprise to some and not to everyone though um so another another thing that we talk we should talk about is society so society is pretty much our context um things happen all over the world all the time but it's it's not that more things are happening now it's that we're more connected than ever before through the internet um and so someone doing a dance ch challenge in Malaysia might be seen in real time by someone sat on their sofa in Europe. Um, and so, yeah, that's like been a huge change and shift within our society. And just like the algorithms that work on the internet, um, things that are happening all over the world are sometimes shaped by other factors, such as political, economics, money, and power. And this can alter not only what we're seeing, it can also make some things more seem more important than others. And finally, uh, humans. So us humans, we're emotional creatures, which means that we have an emotional relationship to information. Um, if I see an article that says it's been scientifically proven that um, hedgehogs are the cutest animal on earth, I might believe it and share it because it confirms my view of hedgehogs. Whereas if I see an article that states that hedgehogs are biting people and they should be eradicated, um, I, I might be less likely to believe it or want to share it. Um, secondly, our brains are constantly sorting through information and making snap decisions about what to believe and what to throw on the side. And finally, we also, um, we often have different motives uh, for sharing information and for sharing things. It could be anything from peer pressure to political influence, um, or we might share something simply because we think it's funny. So these are two, two um, terms that I, I got from the debunking handbook, and I think they're really good just to understand um, how information sticks and this was the continued influence effect um so the continued influence effect is what happens when we still believe that information uh the information we've been given even when it's been proved wrong to us even after it's been debunked um because somehow the information was presented in such a credible way that it's been fed to us in a way that it just sticks and even after debunking we can't really um stop believing it or take it off our minds and the second is the illusory truth effect and that's um that's when we believe things because we have seen it so many times and this often happens on social media especially with viral videos or viral news stories and all of this um in when we join it all together um, it creates what misinformation experts often call the information disorder. So in this section, I, I just want to quickly talk about the term fake news. I know that um, alongside terms like misinformation and disinformation, the, the term fake news gets thrown, thrown around a lot. Um, and so by, when we begin to understand the complexity of information, we need to kind of get past calling it fake news. Um, can anyone tell me why the term fake news might be, mis might be misleading? Or any opinions that, that people have on that? Please feel free to, to share. So, you know, fake news, um, it's, it, the, the term fake in itself suggests that something is true or false. So fake or real, it kind of creates this black or white scenario. Um, but often it's way more complicated than that. Um, fake news is often used in the media and by some politicians 
as a way of discrediting information. Um, but as we'll learn today, later on in this workshop, there's this whole gray area in between what's true um, and what's false. And it's got, yeah, so it's so, so important to really understand the terminology. So I just, yeah, this is a really, a, a graph by First Draft, um, an organization that does a lot of work on fact checking. So we've got, we're going to mostly focus on the, on the two, um, two terms on the left, misinformation and disinformation. Um, malinformation, we can talk about it as well, but it's, yeah, it'll be, we'll, we'll use it a bit less today. Um, so does anyone here know the, know like the difference between misinformation and disinformation? So Sue says miss for mistake and dis for deliberate. Yeah, that's actually a, I never heard, I've never seen it put like that, but I actually really like that. I'm even gonna write it down. Um, exactly, so, you know, disinformation, I'll start with that. Yeah, Merlin says misinformation is a mistake, whereas disinformation is on purpose. Seeing if anyone else wants to comment. Right, so misinformation is false information, which is disseminated regardless of the person who's disseminating intent to mislead. Um, misinformation also describes false content, but the person sharing doesn't necessarily realize that it's false or misleading. Um, often a piece of disinformation can be picked up by someone who doesn't realize that it's false and shares it in their network. And they might even believe it, be believing that they are um, helping. Um, disinformation is when content is intentionally false and designed to cause harm. Um, it might be motivated by different factors, which could be like to make money, to have political influence, um, either foreign or domestic, or to cause trouble. But I think the, the, the important thing here to note is that a piece of information isn't necessarily created as misinformation. It could be created as malinformation or disinformation, but misinformation is really talking about, it's not talking about intention, but it's usually when false information is spread, yeah, because we're, we're sharing it without any necessarily intent to harm. And this is uh, where all of us could maybe be susceptible to spreading misinformation because we might not actually know that we're spreading misinformation or disinformation at all. Ah, yeah, that's the definition. Okay, play this quick game and it's, um, it's just a little game on uh, identifying news stories as miss or dis. And the answers are not always straightforward. I just want to mention that now. Um, and yeah, it's cool if, if we want to have a discussion on any of these. So what does everyone here think uh, this is an example of? Is this miss or is this dis? Sorry, I'm just seeing this question come in from Merlin that says an example it is conspiracy theory. It spreads, it starts uh, off as disinformation or malinformation, but spreads due to dis misinformation. Yeah, exactly, uh, Merlin. That's that's exactly right. Um, so most people here are saying disinformation, um, and yeah, yeah, disinformation, letting them all, disinformation. Yeah, so, um, you know, first of all, this is a message. We can see that it was sent over on uh, WhatsApp. Um, it was possibly, it was forwarded. You know, it could have possibly been forwarded by a friend or family member um, saying that the coronavirus can be a cure, can be cured with um, one bowl of garlic water. Um, there's no link here, so we can't verify this information. It's a forwarded message, so we know that it's not coming directly from the source. And this person might want, want to be helping by sharing the, the information. 
So this is actually, um, you know, this actually could be an example of misinformation, more because the person who is sharing it has forwarded this message um, and not necessarily created it themselves. But, you know, the person who maybe created this post to start with could have made it as disinformation. Um, okay, so this uh, second example is taken from The Onion, a really popular satirical site which is intended to be funny. So what do you think it is, miss or dis? Misinformation. Yeah, so, um, you know, satire often gets reshared and the more people, um, and more people lose the connection to the original messenger and fail to understand that it's uh, satire. So often, um, yeah, this this is misinformation. But you know, I, I don't want to like set this uh, very clear. Um, I think I think all of the all of the answers could be possibly mis or dis. Um, but just for us to get a sense of how these things could change with this as well. So, can anyone tell me what kind of content um, this is often referred to as? Yeah, exactly, Sue. So it is um, it is clickbait. So clickbait content is where headline, visuals, or captions don't actually support the content itself. So um, these kinds of articles are really uh, designed to provoke an intrigue. Sorry, I just see another question. Okay, so the the, the one before, um, since this was satire, this is misinformation. And this one being a, a clickbait post, does anyone have any ideas on what this could be? This, yeah. And there's this, there's this big question. Erica's put a question mark there because actually, um, with 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 examples like this, there's no straight answer. Um, it's technically not disinformation because the content is just misleading, it's not actually false. Um, however, it is designed to deceive the reader and manipulate them to click on it. So I guess here it's, yeah, there's no straight answer, but we could say it's disinformation just for the fact, or yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly how, how we should label these. Um, yeah, maybe this is the last one I'll go to. Yeah, this one and one more. So this is an article that was published um, by Esquire magazine. Um, and it appeared in many other news and social media sites. The headline reads, dolphins return to Italy and clear Venice canals as humans self-isolate. Any ideas what this could be? This miss, yeah. So, I mean, I think an article like this, it evokes really strong emotions in people. And it's it's in a way, it's positive news. So I think readers really want to believe it. I remember that at the beginning of coronavirus, I was seeing loads of um, posts about animals returning to cities because humans were finally, um, yeah, not going out. Um, but actually, this article is misinformation because who are, the people the writing this article really must have thought that this was a real story. There was probably no intent to harm people. Um, and so it was just it was just something that was so widespread around social media that someone picked it up and and wrote about it without necessarily um, doing proper fact checking work. And then finally this one, I'm going to just get the video of this up. So this is a video of Nancy Pelosi. Um, let me give some background. So she's giving a speech in May 2019. Uh, the footage was slowed down slightly 
And just that simple form of manipulation made Pelosi look like she was slurring her words. So I'm just going to play a bit. Trump is among those sharing um, some distorted videos of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on social media. In one clip, it's doctored footage that slows her down to make her sound like she's slurring her words a little bit. Now, the president didn't exactly share that the doctored stuff, but he did share another video. Here's one altered version of her comments at uh, a Center for the American Progress event on Wednesday. It was posted on Facebook by a far right wing group. Again, this is not accurate. This is fake. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. So what's amazing about. Okay, so. Um... Oh, sorry, I just saw your message, Erica. Um... Does anyone have any uh, idea if this would be mis or disinformation? Oh, okay, going back to the, I'll go back quickly to the, the last one about the dolphins. Um, and then we can go back to this Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, so I, I think with all of these examples, um, they, they could be either mis or dis, uh, depending on at what point something was shared, there's no way that we can verify for sure if um, if the person who was first sharing this article on the Esquire um, knew that like this this information was false but chose to share it anyways. Um, so we can only assume that it's misinformation because of because it's a reputable source. Um, yeah, and it's not necessarily a satirical, a satirical website or a website that um, wouldn't necessarily check their sources. But, you know, it could easily be disinformation. It could easily be someone who knew that, um, and just going back to Erica's message, uh, that the absence of humans, the world would be happier, you know, the reasoning behind posting it, if this person knew that all this information was false and that there weren't dolphins returning to Venice canals um, and still decided to post it to get a lot of visitors and views, then yes, we could see that as disinformation. Okay, and then going to the Nancy Pelosi video, everyone here is saying that it's disinformation and it indeed is. So disinformation is also purposefully manipulated content. Um, these are, this is an example of a cheap fake. So a cheap fake is just a cheap version of a deep fake. Um, I think when we, when we think about deep fakes, we think that it's a bit more high tech, that you need a lot of um, data and yeah, a lot of um, experience in designing those, but actually um, with cheap fakes, they can be designed very um, easily and cheaply and quickly and can be very effective as well. Yeah, I'm going to just skip over this one. And then we go to the section about becoming an investigator. So yeah, what can, what can we all do then when we see posts like the ones that I just shared? Um, in this section, in part three, I thought that we could, yeah, look behind the content we see on the internet every day and um, try out some image verification skills using just our eyes for now and no digital tools. Uh, so this is also a little game. So look closely at the images, look closely and carefully and see if you can spot any clues which um, give you an idea of where these images were taken. Yeah, and we, we are trying to guess here the capital city which the image was taken. So does anyone have any idea um, 
where this, in which capital city this image was taken? Yeah, Sue says Berlin. And Sue, why do you say Berlin? Somewhere in Germany. Building signage, yeah, the Württembergish uh, sign. And Salma, why do you think this is somewhere in Germany? Also because of the sign? Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, yeah, we have a few things, uh, a few clues that give it away. Um, the first was the sign, so the language. Uh, the second clue could be architecture. Um, another clue to some could be the Starbucks coffee. And then a clue that's often super hidden, but it's one of the, maybe one of the biggest giveaways is that um, Uban uh, subway sign um, at the back, the train station. Okay, how about this? Um, can anyone guess what capital city this image was taken in? Yep, this is London. And why do you say that, Sue? Oh, <laughs> great. Yeah. So, um, you know, a few of the clues here, uh, it's the architecture, um, Ladbrokes, uh, the bedding shop. Yeah. As, um, Someone here mentioned as well, the traffic signs are in English. You have parking signs. Yeah, so this is actually in Soho um, in London. And this is the last, just the last example. Can anyone guess where this image was taken? Paris, yeah. And what is the, what do you think is the biggest giveaway for your answer? the biggest clue for you to say Paris. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, this major landmark, um, the Arc de, de Triomphe um, is probably the biggest giveaway. Also um, the Yellow Vest, the Gilets Jaunes um, protests that were happening all over Paris and France. Um, and then there's another giveaway, which um, maybe only French people really get and it's this uh, regional flag. Um, this is like the regional flag from Burgundy. And you know, you could also say the weather, um, see that it's cold, that people are wearing hats, uh, all of these things. Okay, um, now we just do a quick exercise on um, having a look at these different social media posts. And um, yeah, can you spot any misleading information? Um, some things to, to always think about when, when doing this exercise is looking at what kind of information has been shared, um, who shared it, are they a reputable source? Um, what is the news about? Have you heard the, the Amazon rainforest fires before? Um, it, does it look like it could be a, a legitimate post from a worthy source? And then how could you go about verifying this information? So does, does this look like a, a trustworthy post to people who are here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so the person sharing it is Madonna. Uh, she has a huge amount of followers. Um, and I'm having major issue with the random capitalization of words. Yeah, exactly. The Amazonia. Um, but yeah, there is one way that we can verify if this 
image is true, and that's using a reverse image search. So a reverse image search, um, basically we would take the this, you could copy and save this image um, that Madonna posted, and you could upload it onto, onto this um, tin eye. And I've already, here it's sorting it by the best match. We can see that this image has um, been posted 441, there's 41, 441 results for it. Um, and when we sort by the oldest, we can see who was the first person to post it. So this image was actually posted in 2018 by The Guardian. Um, that's, and Madonna is posting about this in August 2019. So this was posted um, more than 10 years before Madonna posted it. And you can see the image right here. Uh, and this image is actually from 1989. So it's, it's from another 20 years before the date it was published on The Guardian. Um, so that's a, that's a good resource for you to have to be able to verify your images and see if, um, yeah, just, just try to check uh, if the sources that are posting them have actually got the right, um, yeah. Or is it false? Um, that image as well, you know, it's it's not it's it's a hard, it's a tricky thing there because the image is not false. It wasn't a fabricated image. It is a real image of this of the place Madonna is talking about, the Amazon um burning, but it's just from from the late 80s. So this even this would be a really good example of misinformation. Uh, Madonna probably didn't know that this image was false. I think um, Emmanuel Macron also shared it, the president of France. So you can see how, um, you know, this powerful image is being spread, ar spread around. Um, but in different contexts, it could also be quite misleading. Um, maybe I'm going to skip this one. Okay, so with this... Uh, yeah, with this image here. Can anyone tell me what about it is misleading? Or rather, yeah, let me go back to that one. So back to this one, which is the same um, post. Can anyone tell me what about this might be misleading? A stock image. Yeah, actually, if we had access to that image, we could we could definitely put it into Tinai and have a look um, to see when that image was first posted. So this um, specific WhatsApp message, it's uh, it's basically a forwarded message again. Um, it's good to look at like the date that this was sent. Um, what was the original source? And what was maybe the emotional reaction? The village name, a spoof. Yeah, and not only that, but this 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 post was also shared on April 1st, on April Fool's Day. Um, and so we can kind of look closely at that, that one, it's a forwarded message. Second, um, there's the date reference to April Fool's. Um, it, refer it references woolly mammoths, which are extinct. And yeah, someone could have like a very strong emotional reaction. Okay, so um, I think I've got the right side. So, uh, Part four is sharing with the care. Um, it's just a few ways that, um, how could we kind of see some misinformation on our feed and what can we do about it? So before I go into, I don't know, my tips and my ideas, does anyone here want to share any examples of sometime they've come across misinformation, maybe someone close to them spreading misinformation, how did you deal with it? 
I'd be quite interested in hearing. I left all my WhatsApp groups. Yeah, this used to be in with the what with the WhatsApp groups. I also come from Brazil, and I feel like um, with all my groups with families and friends, I I get so much um, things being shared, and I think I'm not used to that um, so much here in Germany. But I feel that it can get so intense sometimes with the amount of content that's being forwarded and not really verified or even clicked on the links and read. Yeah, Salma says often her parents and grandparents share them. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I think this is a big question overall on how we stop the spread of misinformation. Because again, like, you know, with this stronger emotional connection that we have to the information that we're sharing, it's sometimes really offensive when we call someone out on it. So these are just a few tips of um, how we can maybe stop the spread of misinformation. So first, it's to really recognize your emotions um, and remember that we respond to information emotionally. And so if something gives you a really strong emotional reaction, whether it's shock, anger, or awe, just remind yourself that it could be false or misleading. And you can also tell others like, okay, I can I can see that you're you're sharing this because it really provoked something in you, but maybe take a second step before you publish it or before you forward it, um, just to verify if that's true or if you're just doing it out of the you know strong emotion. Uh, digging a little deeper, also what I what we just mentioned um, and try it out with tin eye. So don't, don't always take the information at face value um, and ask critical questions. Um, who's behind it? Which news source posted it? And why am I seeing this? Uh, talk to people. So everyone is vulnerable to sharing misleading information. Not all of us here might be purposefully creating this information, but we, we are all susceptible to sharing misinformation, especially um, at times when we do it with a really good intention at heart. Um, so yeah, speak to people and let them know that it might be false using a very non-judgmental language um, and always talking less, talking to, to the outcome rather than to the person's intention. And finally, um, it's important to debunk and provide a clear explanation of why that information is false and what indeed is truth, true. Um, these are, this is a little, um, yeah, this is, I thought quite a nice source from debunking, the debunking handbook. Uh, and it's basically giving you this clear um, step into, yeah, into basically like how to take of how to talk about misinformation. So you first lead with the fact um, and talk about the concrete plausible fact and how it fits into the story around the misinformation. Um, warn about the myth, but only mention it once because you don't want it to stick too much to that fact. Explain how the myth misleads and then finally finish off by reinforcing the fact multiple times if possible. And um, providing a causal explanation is always great because sometimes, um, you know, if we don't see a negative intention behind every post, we might not understand why it's being shared or why it's being, you know, why it's out there in the first place. So something that can come out as misinformation, we have to understand that at some point in its lifeline, it could have been created as mal information or misin or disinformation. Is there any questions about this or any um, comments? I see a comment from Erica. When people I care about share misinformation, I try to direct them to credible sources. Yeah. 
Same here. I, I also, I like, there's, there's a huge um, number of really great fact checking um, sources all over the world. Um, and what I really like is sometimes um, just being in touch with what the different fact checking sources are, are posting about to just be kind of conscious about what are the, what are the kinds of misleading information and how are they evolving? Um, and so sometimes you could you can subscribe to a fact checking organization on your Twitter or on your social media, and then you know besides getting uh, people posting um, different types of information, you can also see what's being debunked. Great, and that's that's. Um, the workshop. Uh, I want to quickly. I wanted to also quickly share a few more um, sources. So first draft, which had that great um, chart of misinformation, they also kind of go even deeper and categorize the seven or eight different types of misinformation. Um, it's very handy. Um, yeah, also want to share. A little bit more about exposing the invisible. Uh, it's a project at Tactical Tech that really works on citizen investigation. Um, yeah, and the, finally, the Debunking Handbook 2020, which I found to be really uh, fruitful in in talking about conversations around mis and disinformation. I also thought that since we have a bit of time left to spare, I talk a little bit about the project um, that I work on called The Glassroom Misinformation, uh, The Glassroom, and this edition that I think I mentioned um, earlier on in my talk, in, in my workshop, uh, The Misinformation Edition. So The Misinformation Edition, we have as an online exhibition for the first time. Um, the online exhibition is currently available in 10 different languages. Um, it's available in, in 10 European languages, English, Spanish, German, French, Lithuanian, Slovenian, Swedish, Dutch, and Danish coming soon. And we also have the exhibition available in Ukrainian, uh, Russian and Armenian are coming soon. So I just wanted to share, I don't know if you can see this on my screen. Oh, actually. So on this, on this link here, which I'll post now, um, you, can, you can visit the online exhibition. We have links to the data detox kits. Um, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, this poster talks a little bit about um, this edition and what it what we're mostly sort of trying to focus on. We have two posters here, um, Hooked and Are You Hooked, which are about habit forming behaviors. So Hooked is a is a visualization made by in collaboration with one of the projects. Um, one of the artists from a collective called Density Design, students um, in Milan. And she took a sample of Chinese netizens and she was studying their uh, screen time usage. So this, the pupil here in the center, it's, it's looking at the amount of time these different age groups were on their phones. And then the iris is showing um, what people were mostly on. So that's one of our one of our one of the posters. Um, are you hooked? This is an interactive poster um, for you to fill out your own screen time usage. Um, we have made it available for download, so you can download like a sixteen-page PDF and then glue it together at home. Uh, and then we have. Um, we have another poster called Deep Future. We have um, another theme that's really present in this 
exhibition is Deep Fakes and Cheap Fakes. Um, and this poster is asking how deep fake technology will change our lives and how we see each other. And finally, oh, and finally, we have a poster called How Your Phone is Designed to Grab Your Attention. And it's all about persu persuasive design. and why it's a bit tough for us to put down our phones, how that's been designed into our machines. And finally, um, I just want to quickly note that you can click on these icons, these tablets, and you can access four different apps. Um, maybe I'll just go into Ocean quickly. So Ocean, the Ocean tool is a, here you go. It's a test, it's a quiz. Um, it's completely anonymous. Uh, if you want, you can compare yourself based on age and basically just answer all of these questions from very inaccurate to very accurate. And it's a whole lot of questions which um, are based on a psychometric test, a psychometric profiling test often used by psychologists. Um, and this test was actually also used by Cambridge Analytica in their profiling. And OCEAN stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And so as you fill out these different um, personality traits, it starts to give you a, it, it, it basically categorizes you. So I'm just gonna quickly fill it out and see what I get. And so what happens after you've um, filled out all these questions is the tool will show you what kind of ads you would be most likely fed based on uh, your main traits. So the main trait that I got is agreeableness. Um, it's my most defining characteristic. And so um, based on this information, a political agent could conclude that you probably find it easy to express irritation with others. Uh, people with low levels of agreeableness are prime targets for the political ads shown below, especially when paired with demographic, consumer and public data about you, often as it happens in practice. And then you can see some of the different ads that um, your personality type would be fed. And these are real ads. Um, yeah, so that's one of the games. I also want to show you Deep Fake Lab. Uh, okay, yeah, four more minutes. So Deep Fake Lab is a great, um, it's a great tool if you want to learn more about deep fakes. Uh, it's available in, yeah, a big number of languages. Welcome to our website. My name is Arthur and we are going and it's a really cool tool because it's a really cool tool because you can look at um, the way that deep fakes are made. So here you can look at the visual flaws. I'm gonna wake up and work hard at nothing. Um, you can look at uh, yeah technical details, and they basically walk you through how deep fakes are made. Great, so um, yeah, I invite everyone to visit the exhibition and find out more about this theme of misinformation that we've been talking about today. <laughs>